Hello everyone, Hel here, the vocalist of the Ukrainian metal band Ignea. I welcome you to my The Bandsman Talks, conversations with different artists, mostly from the metal scene, about everything they do to get out of the basement. And my guest today is a beautiful girl and a highly skilled vocalist of the Latvian death thrash groove metal band Mara. This talk was very exciting and full of insights. So if you have a band and you're searching for some tips on how to grow or maybe how to solve some of your uh, issues that you're facing, or maybe you are a metal fan who is interested in the backstage life of bands, I suggest you continue watching and listening um, depending on how you're using this talk because it's available both on YouTube and as a podcast. And don't forget to subscribe uh, to our talk on any platform that you're using uh, because there are a lot more coming soon. Uh, let's go! Thank you for agreeing uh, to do this call. I'm really very excited about this uh, conversation. Um, awesome, thanks for inviting. <laughs> and um, um, these talks that I'm doing with artists, they are mostly uh, about what bands do to get out of the basement and to promote themselves and everything. And there is like one question that I ask uh, everybody. Can you tell me, um, how your band uh, functions and who's in charge of what? All right, so um, I am a communicator. I'm the visual person. So whenever it's something about, let's say, album cover art or uh, video ideas, like video scripts, um, also I take care of all social medias and, and getting in touch with fans. So my husband, which is a bass player, Dmitry, he is in charge of management. So he's doing the booking and the managing of the band. Um, our guitarist is the main songwriter in the band. So all the ideas start from him. And our drummer, as he likes to say, he, <laughs> he tries to help. <laughs> that's, that's what he's words. We asked him in one recent interview, um, so what do you, how do you see your role in a band? And he said, I'm trying to help. Well, <laughs> overall, <laughs> overall, he's a multitasking person. He does, does the massages for us on the tour. He cooks really nice. And um, yeah, overall, he's a really, really nice person and a beast, a drummer for sure. I would love someone to make a massage for me on tour. That is really... Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I remember we were standing in the queue for a massage because everyone was aching, everyone was hurt on that tour. So I think at the end, no one did a massage for our drummer because, you know, no one could do such a good massage as he does. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Uh, so you don't have like a booking company that you're working with or management company. You're on your own, right? Doing everything. Yeah, we don't have the management, but of course we are collaborating with the different bookers uh, from different agencies, and of course they do book us a shows as well. But we don't have like a one permanent one. And you do, you're not signed to, to any label, right? No, no. Would you like to be signed? Um, that's. Uh... Difficult question, and we are in a very different opinions about that in the band. For example, our bassist doesn't want to be signed at all. Um, uh, our guitarist really wants to be signed, and for me, it's I don't know. See, I he, I talk a lot of, uh, with the professional musicians, with signed musicians as well, and I hear all these different stories. Some people have amazing experience, some people have the worst experience. So it really depends. So far we haven't sent out any of our EPs to a record label, so we haven't even searched for a label yet. Uh, our aim is to stay as stay independent as long as we can. 
to really see how far we can go and then trying maybe to search a label because I know whenever you are more well-known musician, then you can get a better contract because at the beginning, if you have zero fan base, nothing much going on, then this is very unlikely that you would get a really good contract from labels. That's my personal opinion. That's cool. I love I love um, your vision of it because like I'm very close to what you're saying and we also have like at the beginning of um, our band we had like all these upsides and downsides of okay I want to be signed okay I don't want to be signed and we also we met a lot of musicians on tour and I always ask people if they can reveal it if they can talk about their experience with labels and I can say that I I talked to three artists of one label and they all have different experiences absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah sometimes also it's very um important if your band plays in the genre that this label can promote in a good way because right. sometimes it's it's not the case um, how is your experience overall with the labels we we're independent just like you guys and uh right. we had any offers we had offers from small labels, but I I see no reason of being signed to a small label for us because like I have marketing experience. We already have developed quite a fan base all over the world. For example, the latest album was funded through Patreon only. So mm -hmm. I'm like right now, I only see the problem uh, with promotion that we have like kind of a limit of what we can do on our own. Yeah. But but I also don't see, like, this year, I am even happy that we're not signed because a lot of labels, they postponed all the releases, you know, and all the stuff. And we didn't want to do this because we want to be active and because our patrons who funded the album, they were waiting, you know, for the release and right. it would be unfair and everything. Mm -hmm. And so far, like you said, I don't see the, reason, the, the need to be signed right at the moment. Right. Yeah. That we can develop further being independent as well. Although we have a booking agency like the constant booking agency we're working with. Yeah, that's great. That is and cool. That helps a lot. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, our first tours happened with them, and uh, I, I really we couldn't do anything without them, like on our own, just to book decent gigs and everything. But it's a different story, you know. So you're also working in a booking agency, is that yeah. right? Yeah, this is the same agency. And I started like um, working part time, I guess, one year ago or s not one year ago. We already had like this shitty year with concerts, I guess that already almost two years ago. But I'm mostly in charge, you know, of the administrative part and mm -hmm. book some bands for festivals. But like I'm not a proper booking manager, so to say. Uh -huh. But uh, I love this experience because, because now I understand, um, you know, I don't have any pink glasses anymore about the concerts. And I also understand that very good bands, they can also get very shitty offers in terms of, um, you know, the performance fee or something like that. And uh, of course, it's the work of the booking manager to make the best deal. But sometimes, you know, the festival just says, sorry, but we have like only this limited budget. We don't have any more funds to pay for this artist. Or maybe they cannot provide you, um, you know, a four star hotel or something like that. So it's it's it depends. Or maybe they have already the list of the bands in this genre already booked. So they don't want this band not because this band is bad but because like the slots with this genre are full yeah, yeah. So, um so it was really a precious experience just to see like from the other perspective how it goes and i think yeah. that any person like any artist that also has worked as somebody else like in the industry it you know tour manager or booking manager or maybe live sound engineer they just have absolutely other perspective mm -hmm. and I, you are also a vocal coach and this is uh, what i also wanted to talk to you about 
So, I mean, you also have like kind of another perspective, like a broader perspective than just a performing artist. And there is a range of questions that I want to ask you uh, in terms of this uh, experience. Um, and um, first of all, like you have a very long vocal path. I read about it, like that you started singing when you were three years old. But yeah. what what like fascinated me is the list of uh, vocal coaches you've worked with and including Melissa Cross and um, uh, the vocalists of Whitechapel, right? So, I mean, can you tell me about your path as an extreme metal vocalist? And I don't know, what can you advise to people who start learning this technique? And just let me know. All right. So uh, I started screaming in a band, what it was, 2002. So, uh, yeah, that, that was, seems like a long time ago. And then I was active in metal bands from 2002 till 2007. And then there was a break. I went to study vocals to London. I was studying in vocal tech. Um, and it's like a university, basically. It's uh, um, the master's degree. And uh, I stop doing metal at that time. The reason was that it's so surprising that uh, in the England, the metal scene is not so strong and I couldn't find a band. So I stopped screaming. I was focusing mostly on learning the clean vocals. Um, then I met there my husband, my, my bass player at the moment, and we started to do a duo together. So my main focus went purely on the clean vocals. Um, so I was away from metal for nine years. That, yeah, that was too long, I guess. And then I returned and uh, then I started. When I returned, I had this very strong, clean fundament basis. And then I started to learn extreme vocals professionally. Before that, I was just doing whatever I could. Back in 2002, there was no YouTube, there were no tutorials, so I was just figuring it by my own. I was calling to my landline, to my voicemail, and leaving <coughs> the message. <laughs> and then listening back, and I was like, mm, that's kind of good. So whenever I just started, the sound came out. I, I did not have to struggle for it, so that's why... That was also probably the reason why I took it for granted back then. I was not really practicing much and like putting a lot of work in. But then when I returned to metal again, then I started to really study more in depth. So my first extreme vocal coach was Melissa Cross and it was very, very lucky instance how I met her. She was doing a seminar in Poland and back then I lived in Latvia so we were traveling with a car from Latvia to Poland just to meet her and yeah it was great it was amazing so she put the first strong fundament I have for extreme vocals um, was very valuable it was just one weekend back then um, and I learned quite a lot also about teaching others. Um, then I met Melissa, I think, two more times. One was a seminar, one was just meeting her, and uh, she would return to Poland again, and I would be there to, to, to meet her. Um, probably she would come again this year, but she's only, only doing online classes. Um, also, at the same time, I was talking to other vocalists, just trying to figure out what they're doing, how they're doing things, um, trying to figure out the stuff by my own, uh, trying to find all the possible extreme vocal schools out there. There were not that many, but I, I found them all. <laughs> so. <laughs> I was just studying as much as I can, really. And um, then my last vocal teacher, which I also want to mention, is um, 
Enrico H. Di Lorenzo. He's a phonetrician uh, doctor and also amazing death metal vocalist. So he showed me I go to the very, very extremes with my vocals still being safe. And since the genre I love the most is extreme death metal, for me, it was very, very valuable to know that I can go as brutal, as intense as I want to and still be safe. So my advice for the guys trying out the techniques is just be smart. It's not about yelling. It's not about being as loud as possible. These are coordinations. And then you have to learn the very, very fundamentals, the very basis. I have also a tutorial available on YouTube with all the basic techniques, uh, particularly for false chord techniques. That's all it is. This is how you start go straight away with the full growl and then try to figure out how it works. You start with very, very easy light coordinations first and then you build on top of that. There are no shortcuts. It's about practicing great techniques. Yeah, um, a few things that I wanted to say after uh, your speech about extreme vocals. First of all, I yesterday I made um, Another interview with the vocalist of Five Rand, and she also mentioned Mr. Lorenzo. Uh, so I'm okay. very curious now about him because I haven't heard about this person, but I was fascinated to hear that he's a mixture of a doctor and a vocal coach. And I think that is awesome because I believe that vocal coaches should know like um, the building of our vocal uh, mechanism and how it works and how to secure your cords and everything from being distracted because extreme vocals, I think that they are extreme not only in how they sound, but also in how extremely they can harm you if you do it yeah. improperly, you know? Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, another thing that I wanted to ask, I already forgot, <laughs> oh my God. Um, ah, yeah, YouTube channel. I actually checked out this video that you had and I loved this exercise, the woof, with, uh, uh, because it really, it's really helpful. I mean, I, um, I can do extreme vocals, but what I struggle the most is like being, um, so to say, stable with it. So for example, like one day I can do it like beautifully for two hours long, like everything is all right. And the other day I really struggled to find the spot of thing, feeling comfortable with it and everything. And maybe another thing that also other uh, vocalists talk to me about is like, um, for how long are you able to hold like the phrase with extreme vocals? Because a lot of people, you know, they blow out too much air, so to say, and then they can, you know, when they start, they can uh, grow for two words, then three words, then like, and so I think that like this woof exercise is really good in your mind from thinking about what you're exactly doing. Yeah, so, absolutely. That's yeah, right. so guys, if you're watching this YouTube video, make sure to check out. I will put down the link to this tutorial. Uh, and like one of my questions was, are you planning to develop your YouTube channel further? And what focus are you going to make if you are? Right. Uh, since that tutorial became very popular in relatively short time, that got me very confused because my main idea with the YouTube channel was just doing vocal covers because uh, that's what I do when I don't when I am not active with my band when there's nothing much going on this is what I do in a free time just having fun with these vocal covers and then um, people ask me a lot about doing a tutorial and I was thinking about it for a really long time. I did not want to do it because I believe that there are already a lot of instruction out there available why to make another tutorial. But um, then the pandemic hit and I had not nothing much. Like, what can I do? Nothing else, not, nothing to do. So I was, I was, I was just, sitting here and doing the video 
Uh, and I put it out mainly also for my students because the, those exercises are the ones that I give in the first lesson. Straight away, this is how we explore the sound. So then I thought also it would be very beneficial for my students uh, to have the sound reference because it's very important that they do the sound correctly so they pay attention to that. Um, yeah, I just posted it and then it was not doing kind of well at the beginning, but then just YouTube algorithm picked that video and just threw it on everyone's home screens. And I think in the matter of week, I went from around 11,000 views to 100,000 views. So it was crazy. So my schedule for the voice lessons was overbooked on one week's time. It was insane. <laughs> but thanks, YouTube. <laughs> that was great. Um, so right now I am still, I, I don't have enough time to develop my channel. So I still think, what should I do next? Um, my plan is to do more vocal covers that I promised for my Patreons to do. So I'll continue doing that. And regards the tutorials, I don't know yet. I'll see. Either I'll make some other uh, videos or maybe I should go to make a full um, online video school. That would be an, uh, another option. So I still don't know yet. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. <laughs> I just okay. go with flow. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Things That's just happen, you know. <laughs> I think that YouTube does a lot to promote like the bands, the artists, vocal coaches, like anyone. And I really don't understand when people, they refuse or they don't want to, you know, do anything on YouTube or they say that this is a shitty platform. But really, if, you, if you're doing something right, if it really picks your video, it really does all the work because... We've got one video, like our first video with the orchestra. And like, in my opinion, it that was super nice. No, like for me, we hate this video because back then, <laughs> yes, we didn't, know, we didn't know, um, you know, we even didn't have a director for this video. We didn't know what to do, how to do it properly and everything. It will look very funny out there, like in our opinion, but because YouTube picked it, it's still the most viewed video and YouTube still keeps recommending it. And um, there was a time during this pandemic when I tried to learn more about YouTube algorithms and all the things. And I found out like that this video is still like on the first page, on, in the third place uh, by the tag Symphonic Metal. So, nice. So yeah. how does... How did that transfer to you getting the gigs? How could you say, do you do the YouTube view count helps you to get more shows and more opportunities, something? Nothing, zero. How many no, views do you, you have for that I, video? You know, I would say that um, we gained a lot of fans and listeners yeah. from this YouTube video. Right. So it um, converted to us in terms of album sales in terms of um social media likes and followers in terms of spotify um listens and like digital music sales everything uh -huh. but what i learned like um during like the last five years of our band because these are like the most active years is that what you have on the internet doesn't influence your shows absolutely not why not? Um, What's your take on that? Why not? Well, I just know that um, you will get invited to the shows and uh, you will get paid more to do more shows. It's like getting, you know, a job without any experience. Uh, uh. Yeah, so it's, it's just, yes, they look at it, but it's like one of the latest things that they will check out about the band. So if you already had certain tours, you are a more desirable artist than if you just are a star on the internet. Of course, maybe if you have like, I don't know, 
um, 100 million views or something like that, then it may influence uh, your like touring. Um, but it's really, those are absolutely different things. And you know, there are some bands who are more concert bands and bands who are studio bands. So they sound better. Or, right. And this is maybe the same, like there are more online bands, more offline bands, because I also know a lot of bands who tour and they perform at large festivals, they do almost nothing with their social media. And they have very, you know, low uh, fan base online, but like they have sold out shows at the same time. So it's really not related. And I think that the most successful bands are the bands who have both very active touring and very active online presence. I right. think- but then what is your suggestion for the band starting out now? Because I mean, first of all, it's really difficult to get exposure on social media if you do not have the promoters and, and stuff like that. And also they cannot get the shows yet. So what what would be your suggestion for, for bands starting out? Because at the moment, I know that there are a lot of bands sprouting out in this time of pandemic. So what would be your suggestion? Well, I would say that um, it's better to make a very well thought campaign. So if you have a release and this is these are like the failures that we did before. So, I mean, you have a release coming up, uh, so it's better to really save money um, that you can spend on promotion. Because without like sponsored posts on Facebook, without maybe paid sponsored articles like in press, although I, I really don't love them, but some people, they, they find it's very important to be covered, you know, in magazines. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, save money on promotion. If you haven't toured at all, if you don't have any experience, buy on shows are the best. So buy on is something like when you have, um, when you pay to perform with somebody, it can be a show, it can be a festival, it can be a tour. And I think that buy ons are something that I disrespect if the bands who already achieved something, if they do it, because I find it, you know, useless. If you haven't toured at all, you just have to understand that this is the price that you pay to the organizer of the tour or the promoter. They take the risk because they haven't seen you on stage. And there are a lot of things that can go wrong. You know, they don't know how many people you will attract to the show. They don't know if you are, you know, a decent performer, meaning that you don't hold anyone back that you do your changeovers properly, that you do your loadings, loadouts properly and everything. So they just take the risk to put on their stage. So I kind of, I kind of, we are, our policy in our band is not to go on these pay to play shows because the, this is the idea we totally do not support simply because they are so overpriced, like so overpriced that I do not know musicians, especially the ones starting out, how can they afford to go on tours like that? We cannot, we get these offers a lot of times to, to go on these type of shows. It's just, if you calculate and then you go that uh, maybe for a two week uh, tour, you need to spend 15,000 euros. Where do we get that money from? You know what I mean? I think that it really depends on the offers because we have, like, it depends on how you find the offer. Because, of, of course, you need to have the feedback, you know, you need to get the crowds and everything. But because we also, we uh, got a lot of shitty offers and they cost the same uh, enormous price. But then at, at some point you just get the offer that you can afford. And that doesn't mean that you are going to make, I don't know, three years of buy-ons. And also what I always say is that 
you can refuse to do by once. You can just do small shows on your own, but it's such a long journey. I mean, by once they just help you to um, to make it in a shorter amount of time. So. Depends. Yeah, again, I've spoken with the bands who do take these tours. I mean, you know, it's they just continue doing them and, and there's nothing much of the change. It really, really depends again on, on the band and offer. It depends so on the band. It really depends because like I remember like when we were on our uh, first tour, which was a buy on tour, for example, um, it didn't cost a lot of money, like I cannot disclose it, but we could afford it. And come on, we're guys from Ukraine. It's not a rich country. Yeah. And, um, yeah. But for example, um, the crowds that were there at the shows, they really uh, loved us. And for example, we sold more merch than the headliner of this tour. So... Um, when we were like on another tour, uh, which wasn't a Bayonne tour, but at the same time, like mm, people tend to love us, even if they didn't uh, hear us and see us before. But I met a lot of bands who are doing Bayons every year for five years, and it doesn't work for them. And they tour with awesome bands and everything. So I mean, Maybe they need to think about something else, about maybe changing their appearance, changing, like working on their stage performance, maybe changing their music. But if they just have to understand that it's not the problem of the buy-ons, because if we take away like the money that they paid, if they would be doing simply shows, and if these shows wouldn't work for them as well, I mean, then something is wrong. But I can say that finding a good offer, like a good buy on offer, is also very important because there are, I don't know, small festivals with uh, 300 people and they offer you a slot for 1000 euros. It's not a good offer. You just have to understand it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, of course, we can go in more in the details about that. I just look at this as overall picture that you have to invest your money to go play there you know invest your money to for your expenses and everything and i think at the very root cause uh, at very root it's 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 a bit wrong especially since it is it is, it is but i i just think that every band decides for the, themselves but this yeah, is kind of, sure. I this mean, is it's, kind of advice I, that um it just you know if somebody told me about this five years ago when i had these pink glasses and i we were trying to secure shows on our own and we just spent two years after the release of our uh, no not to you yeah almost two years sitting at home and having no shows because like nobody were interested in us and if people like from the very beginning told me that you could do like this by ons and just don't waste your time, that would be cool. We would be like in another spot right now. That's all That's all I'm saying. And um, I know that maybe like being in the European Union, sometimes like your personal contacts, they also help because you're closer to everything that's happening out there. So maybe if you have like fellow uh, promoters who could maybe put you as an opening band, it's also, it's also cool, you know, but like we didn't have such people. And I also know that a lot of promoters, they just don't work with you directly as an artist. They want a booking agency or someone to guarantee that you will not fuck up, you know. So I just always say that all bands, they have different paths because in many cases, it's also a thing of luck, you know, Maybe someone sees you at some show, but um, I just cannot count on that, you know. <laughs> I know that it's really a tough question, but also I don't understand bands who are, you know, dropping out their music and they don't invest in promotion because it's just, it doesn't work otherwise. 
Like also yesterday we were talking with Julia, the vocalist of Five Brand, and I asked her about if they do sponsored posts on Facebook, you know, if they make advertising. And she said yes, because like if you don't do it, then like your fans, your followers only see like only 1% of followers see what you're doing. And I agree with her like this is you we all are very angry with you with Facebook and Instagram for that but we cannot change that so I mean it's better to adapt and just and just do it yeah again it's a personal personal choice yes yes it is but it's like uh, if you're not doing it then somebody else will be doing it and you know getting more views and post engagement and everything so so yeah, <laughs> um, let me check out the questions that I still have for you. Um, I know that you released uh, a new EP in May mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, I know that you have a couple of uh, guest musicians on this EP, uh, the vocalist of Soil Work, right? Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and the bass player of uh, Six Feet Under. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my question is, how did you contact them and what was the um, working process? I mean, did you send them the music or did you meet in person to record everything? Can you tell me about that? Right, so uh, Jeff from Six Feet Under is actually a good friend of ours. ours. Uh, he is a good friend uh, of my bassist, uh, of my husband, sorry. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I fucked it up. Anyway, so where was I? Um, so Jeff Hugel's uh, actually, he, so Jeff Hugel actually is a good friend of ours, and uh, he's a good friend of my husband. Um, they have been in contact through a company called Warwick, uh, where my husband also worked for uh, many years. Um, so yeah, whenever Six Feet Under toured Germany, when we lived there, we were all, all the time we met him, he invited us to the shows and, uh, we've seen him many, many times. So of course, when we asked him, can you do a guest appearance for our EP? He agreed and he did a really nice bass solo there. Um, Bjorn is not that attainable, unfortunately, but we got our contacts through him, also through the company of Warwick. So, um, yeah, we got in contact with him and just asked him if he can do it. So with him, it was less personal in that sense. You know, we just send out the track and he recorded the vocals. I had already lyrics written and the uh, melody lines, but he felt free changing these melody lines, adding the backing vocals and so on. And then we put the song together. That is cool. That is really mm -hmm. cool. Um, just one. And what do you think, like, do collaborations really help, like, for the band to grow? And what's your opinion, like, of uh, make tracks featuring, like, guest musicians in general? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Of, of course, the once you have some well-known names, well-known bands that of, of course that helps a, a lot, as well as just collaborating with the great musicians overall. I think it's just a pleasant experience to sing with another great vocalist, you know, the Bjorn, come on. <laughs> and Jeff is just amazing, amazing bassist. Um, he is also doing a lot of bass solo stuff. So he's not maybe that active when he plays in Six Feet Under, but his solo stuff is amazing. So just it's not only about having the name and you know having a bad musician that's like for example does doesn't work like that but uh overall i really like collabs a lot you know so if you're following me on facebook or instagram you can see all the time i'm collaborating with bands with the musicians with other vocalists we do these vocal covers together i love that i know it's not very common in metal and i don't know why but um 
metal he heads are more about themselves. They do not collaborate much, but I love that. I totally love that. So whenever there's a chance like that, pff, I'm in. <laughs> Sometimes it's scary. You know, I, I had the opportunity to sing, uh, sing a few songs live with a uh, guitarist of Skunk Anansi. It was insane experience. I was super scared. <laughs> I'll be honest. I'll, it was scary as hell, but I totally went for that because at the end, it was one of the best musical experiences I had in my life. I see, I see. I think that this year brought us all closer, you know, in the metal community because everybody yeah. was staying at home. And I think that this is the most fruitful years in terms of collaborations and like these right. kind of talks and everything. And I just hope that it will continue when we start touring again, as, you know, that it doesn't stop. I hope so. Uh, by the way, like oh, one more question that I wanted to ask, for example, if when you're doing like all these collabs and your vocal covers and everything, do you have like the recording equipment at home or do you go somewhere else to record your vocals for these things? Oh, I do everything in my bedroom. <laughs> I... Uh... Here's the thing, um, my Patreon saw I did the video about uh, of me recording the um, uh, the session work I did, so explaining all the recording process that I have, and people are kind of surprised when they see what kind of minimal setup I have, and with that minimal minimal setup, I'm able to achieve the highest quality professional recordings that a lot of people are just amazed how how good the quality is. And when they see my setup, which is super minimal, and the the ways how we do record my vocals is is just <laughs> it's a lot of people do not expect that. So um, yeah, my husband has been studying the vocal engineering, and uh, yes, it's about as he explains, it's about skill and knowledge rather than about equipment. So equipment, a lot of times, is so overrated and people buy a lot of this stuff, you know, just expensive and this and that and that, but they do not necessarily have the skill to do that. So for him, the turning point was when he saw some of the best sound engineers working with basically nothing and creating these amazing quality recordings. So he was like, how it comes? And then he went to study with these sound engineers and they just explained it's not about the that super expensive equipment you have. It's about how you use it. Like how how do you use? Because these are the tools. They do not, I mean, create the whole recording themselves. It's, it's I mean, I, I think skill is much underrated nowadays. Yeah, it is. Well, mostly I think because you know we all have access to our laptops. And you can buy pretty much anything right now. This is also the reason why more metal bands are appearing. And for example, if you've been sinning from your childhood, for example, I'm not a professional musician. And yet, like right now, I am um, I have income from mus music only. But for example, this is what I'm trying to work on right now. I'm trying to become a professional vocalist because I feel really... Um, I feel that my skills are not enough and I'm trying to change it. And that's why like I, right now I have, you know, a playlist, for example, when I do vocal warm ups and everything, I have more standard ones, but I also love um, this thing like karaoke from YouTube. I just, you know, take some instrumental tracks, but then I thought, okay, I should do like this for extreme vocalists as well. And I found a, quite a lot of, you know, instrumental tracks, uh, versions of extreme metal songs and I even made you know a playlist right now just to yeah practice right. yeah uh, but like this thing of recording vocals at home is a really I think that's also you you if you have the skill you can do it even with very mm, cheap equipment so to say 
Although, like, um, I'm always um, interested, like, in this question of si sound isolation and all the reverb that's happening, you know, and I watched a lot of YouTube videos on that, and, you know, there are so many um, opinions on that, because, you know, uh -huh. like, for, there is, for example, like, for vocalists, like, this mirror, um, how, to, how do you say it, um, the screen that you put, like, uh, your microphone, in front of and for example um, people are buying a lot of such stuff and it also costs from like very cheap to a huge amount of money and uh, at the same time a lot of uh, my fellow sound engineers they say that this is useless and everything so I mean it's a tough question for me how to make your voice sound good when you're recording at home yeah. Right. I I, ha I don't have that thing. I have a curtain. Okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm standing uh, in front of me. There's a window. I have really thick curtains. So that serves a purpose for me. Yeah, I know. And uh, I don't have it either. I was planning to buy it. And it's very good that I just asked a lot of people if it's really worth it. And like, Actually, none of my fellow musicians, some some people have it, but they don't use it, you know, so it's, mm. but I mean, with all the information on the web, it's, it's crazy, it's crazy. Right, also about all the equipment that is available, and there's such a things you can buy, if you are about to invest money in this, you, it's never ending, you can buy this, you can buy that, 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 and then you get overwhelmed with all the stuff and you're like oh my god i already spent you know 10 grand for that and i still need more <laughs> you know? yes yeah it's it's crazy okay. yeah of course the the home studios take uh, can eat a lot of money for sure yeah um i think that we will be slowly like wrapping it up not to take much of your time but i wanted to ask like what plans do you have now with the band i understand it's hard to plan with everything that's happening but like, maybe you're working on something that you can tell. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> I was hoping you would not ask the question about the plants. <laughs> Sorry, but I, you know, people also interview me and they ask me about it. I need my revenge, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, I'll ask you a, another question in return after then. <laughs> um, Right, the plans in 2020. Oh, it's about to end, so it's not that bad. Uh, right, we have some shows, of course, postponed for the next year. Fingers crossed. Our first show is in April. So who knows what happens? But uh, yeah, um, um, not all of the shows, of course, were postponed. Some of them were canceled and gone. But uh, yeah, also. We're slowly working on the new music, trying to put pieces together, and um, yeah, it would be great for us to finally meet because we're split up into different countries, so we do this remote recording, sending files back and forth. So at this moment, it really felt it would be better that we could be together and, and, and just jam. Um, since we want to develop our sound further, I really, really figure out what else we can bring, what else Mara is about, kind of more exploring in depth rather than return the previous, uh, than not return, sorry, than, than to just uh, replicate the same ideas that we had before. So, um, yeah, we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> so it's... Uh, for me, it's about, you know, the, the, the main idea for me is uh, the love of the metal. I do it because I really love to do it and I just cannot live without it. That's that's my main goal about metal. As long as I can enjoy doing it, I'm fine. I'm good. So I don't care that much if, if you know, it's commercial, not commercial, whatever, you know, that uh, if I lose that sparkle of singing the particular song, then that's it, I'm probably done, you know. So that is why we're just now searching, finding, finding something, brewing, you know, and um, yeah, some new recordings will be 
soon for sure next year hopefully the beginning of the next year one single is in the making by the way now so can i have my revenge yes <laughs> my revenge is as follows how is it to be a female in the metal band oh my god <laughs> Oh, tell me, how often do you get this question? How often? I would probably guess every interview. Yes, every interview and actually every interview I say, oh my God, like, you know, there is never happening that I don't get this fucking question. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm always saying that the guys in the metal industry, they have more problems right now because it's easier really easier to promote a band if you have a girl in this band and i always say that um, you know when i was on the first tour i was the only girl in four bands and i felt like a princess there i mean like they didn't allow me to carry any boxes i was the first to take the shower i was the first to eat and blah 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 so i mean i think that this is such an outdated question Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yes. Dividing metal heads in uh, genders, it's totally outdated. Guys, you watching there, do not ask a female screamer this question. Never. <laughs> I think that, you know, like earlier, the most popular question was like, for example, what does the name of your band mean? But if you're a female fronted mm -hmm. band, this is the most popular question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the first time I got this question, I was like, oh my God, I'm a woman. Oh my God. Like, you know, finally you, you're putting a person, like, you know, the identity. Oh my God, I'm a woman in metal. <gasps> I should freak out now. I should be, I should do something weird, act weird. I, I don't know. <laughs> I've, I've, I haven't even figured out the, the answer to that. I never think about, oh, I'm now... A woman in this band along with the guys yes you know i feel it i'm a woman i'm like i'm a musician like there's there's no gender there you know you just create the music and then everything else just fades away yeah and I'm, nobody asks i don't know a doctor if about like how is it to be a female doctor for example <laughs> Oh, wait, wait, you have these guys makeup artists, right? And you would ask the, how it is to be a guy makeup artist, or a guy hairdresser, oh my God, or, yeah, well, or guy cook, you know? <laughs> although, like, the most famous uh, makeup artists, cooks, and hairdressers are guys. Yeah. Do they ever get this question? Hmm, I wonder. <laughs> I think, yes. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for doing this call. I think that people will have a lot of insights from this conversation. Oh, I hope too. <laughs> and I, I hope that uh, next year will be easier for us all and that we meet in person somewhere at the backstage. Would be oh, really no, nice. 